Welcome to the End Times Bible Study. It's an honor to have you joining me tonight in this Bible study where we give God all the glory. He is the one who guides us and leads us by the Holy Spirit into all truth and understanding. And you know, we're looking into the end times, the return of Jesus Christ and the consequent judgment. That is something we have to always keep in mind that judgment is coming. And it's at that time that Jesus is going to separate the sheep from the goats. You know, the goats have always been in the church. They've always been there right from the very beginning. If you read Paul's letter to the Galatians, there were goats in the Galatian church steering the whole body towards a new gospel, a gospel of their own creation that denied the power of God and rather turned to traditions in order to attain righteousness. And Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And he also said, if anyone teaches a gospel contrary to what I preach to you, let him be accursed. Very strong language from the apostle, but he is defending the gospel. He wants the gospel left alone, and he wants to make it clear that no one should be messing with the gospel. In the church of Corinth, you have a man marrying his stepmom, and the people in the church believe that it's a good thing. We know it wasn't the Holy Spirit causing and leading this development in the church. And it was the goats. You know, even in Jesus' 12 disciples, one was a goat. And the other disciples didn't know. When Jesus said at the Last Supper, one of you will betray me, they didn't all turn their heads and look at Judas. They didn't know who he was talking about. They were oblivious. So we have to realize the goats are always there. And at the time of judgment, we're going to see who they are. Now, I don't want you to think of them as nefarious, lurking, evil uh, people. In most cases, they're, they're just deceived. They heard a gospel contrary to what Paul preached. They have adopted religious traditions without knowing Jesus Christ. But in the end, the truth will be told and it will be revealed. And it's going to be with deep sadness that Jesus tells them, depart from me, you sinners, you who practice sin, for I never knew you. You see, that's a a clear distinction between the goats and the sheep. The goats have no power over the flesh. As we once were before we knew Jesus Christ, we too were slaves to sin. But now we have everything given to us to live a holy and godly life. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. It's those willing sins that the Holy Spirit can set us free from. Grace can release us from that bondage. We're always going to have some degree of uncharity or a lack of sympathy. You know, to him who knows to good, do good and does it not, it is sin. Well, there are a million good things we could be doing and we know that. So in a sense, we sin all day, every day. And that's why the Bible says, um, you know, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But we have to make that distinction. This isn't willing sin we're talking about. And sanctification is a process of working out those heart sins, those uncharitable thoughts, those angry moments, those cruel moments, those careless moments. But willing sin is a different animal. That is the sin that leads to death. And it is the power of Jesus Christ through the gospel that releases us from the bondage bondage of sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. I hope that's clear. I don't want you to feel burdened and hopeless. Well, I can't live a perfect life. No, we we can't. As long as we are in the flesh, we will be less than perfect. But it's when we willingly and knowingly 
commit adultery or lie or steal or um, gossip. These willing sins are bondage and we need to break free of them. So tonight we are starting in Revelation 12 and we're breaking away from the timeline that is laid out up until this point. And in verse 12, we start to get into a series of visions that John is having. And the first one, we're going to read from verses 1 to 4, pertaining to the woman clothed with the sun and the dragon. So let's begin in chapter 12, verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. So beginning with the first vision, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. Now, the crown of 12 stars represents the 12 tribes of Israel. And this woman is Israel. And I find it very interesting. She is clothed with the sun and the moon is under her feet. Now, the moon represents islam the god al law or the god in arab used to in muhammad's time refer to the moon god that was the chief deity um the time muhammad grew up in was polytheistic they believed in many different gods but the chief among them the god was the moon all Allah, the God. And that's why you see the crescent moon as the symbol of Islam. And here we see her standing with the moon under her feet, a place of submission. The um, children of Ishmael, remember Abraham took Hagar, um, Sarah's, con- Sarah's uh, maid as a concubine and bore Ishmael because um, Sarah wanted to help God out, help God fulfill the promise. Here, take my servant and have a child with her. And that was Ishmael. And Ishmael became the father of the Arabs. Ishmael was not the child of the promise. Isaac was. And Isaac would be the father of Israel or the Jews. So we know that that Isaac is the child of the promise and Ishmael is not. And this here is a clear representation of seeing the children of Ishmael submitted under Israel. And that's that's really interesting because right now in the Middle East. Is there an Arab nation that doesn't want to see Israel burnt to the ground? (laughs) Israel lives in a constant state of readiness for attack from all the Arab, all the Ishmaelite um, neighbors that they have there. The other interesting thing is she is clothed with the sun. Now, Egypt worships the sun, Ra, and it's symbolic of her. Um, using that as a garment, it's nothing. So it it really speaks of Israel's dominance over the religions that it grew up in the midst of. And then in verse 2, she was with child and cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And we know who this child is that Israel bore. Um, we celebrated every Christmas time. Mary and Joseph had a baby boy. This is the child that she's pregnant with. 
And moving into verses three and four, it speaks of the red dragon, which we know is Satan. Another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And on his heads were seven diadems or crowns. Now it says his tail swept away a third of the stars. And we know that a third of the angels left their heavenly estate to follow Satan in rebellion. And threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. So that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Now, Herod went out to murder every boy under the age of two in Bethlehem in the hopes of eradicating the Messiah. Now, I don't believe Herod himself was felt too overly threatened by a toddler, but the demon controlling him or influencing him certainly was. And Satan knew that if he could stop prophecy at any point or this is what he believes if he could stop prophecy at any point he could stop the chain of events that lead to his destruction he knows that the messiah will bring you know what did we hear in the garden of eden the serpent will bruise your heel but you will crush the serpent's head under your foot the serpent doesn't want his head crushed so he's trying to stop this And at first, his first attempt is to destroy the male child. And he does that by sending, by firing up Herod's heart and having him go and try and eliminate the Messiah. And the seven heads and the ten horns speak of the beast or the final kingdom. And There are reasons we could believe the seven heads uh, represent seven hills. The ten horns represent ten kings. Um, Some people hypothesize this could be referring to Rome. I don't believe that it is. Um, we'll, We'll hope and pray for more spiritual discernment as we go. Uh, I'm no wise guy. I'm no genius, brilliant theologian. I'm just depending on the Holy Spirit to to give us insight and understanding, not so that we can be wise. Collecting knowledge is a very Greek thing to do, a very Gentile thing to do. We love knowledge and the Jews love a sign, but the gospel was neither. It's foolishness to the wise, meaning it's foolishness to us Gentiles, and it's a stumbling block to the Jews. We aren't going to be prepared by leaning in our own understanding. We're going to be prepared by submitting to the Holy Spirit and being led by the hand like little children. So God bless you and thanks for joining me tonight.